Good morning, everybody. This is Steve Bambera, Extension Specialist in Entomology. It took me a moment to uh, figure out that I had to push the button for my microphone. Sorry, I'm new at this. Never done it before. Um, today we have a great program. And before we get into that, I'd just like to tell you that we have Lee J. Hicks with us as our technical moderator. If we have any problems, uh, please direct them to her. I have no clue how to fix them. So that would be great. And also, Barbara Shu from the Department of Plant Pathology is going to be the co mc host for us today. So Barbara is in the background should I pass out in the middle of all this. And she'd be happy to help us out. Uh, Lee J, do you have any little um, technical things to mention? I'm sure we have a few people that have not been on Illuminate. We won't try to cover everything in detail, but there's probably a few new people. Sure. Um, first off, good morning, everyone. My name is Lee J. Um, if you look in the top left, you'll see a list of participants. Underneath that window, there are some emoticons that you can click on. You got a smiley face or a confused face. You can clap um, or disagree. Um, to the right of that, you have a green check and a red X. That will um, allow us to get feedback from you. If you can hear me just fine and you're having a wonderful day, click on that green check. If, you're, if you can hear me, which I'm sure you can, and you are not that happy that it's Tuesday, you can give me a red X. <laughs> But it looks like everyone um, happily is, is having a great day. Um, if you have a question, you can type it in the chat box. That is below our participant area. And um, if you have any questions, you can type it in the chat window, and I will get to you as um, soon as I see it. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. Um, today, just to remind you that uh, we are here with some uh, horde agents who are going to give us some of their words of wisdom and things that are going on in their counties. And our featured speaker today is, is going to be a good one. And we also have some information about uh, some showstopper plants. So uh, Charlotte Glenn is our first one, our first speaker. We have our usual today. I, I didn't mention David Orr's uh, name. I will mention him in just a moment when we get through our agents. But let's start off with Charlotte. And Charlotte is one of our experienced agents from Pender County. And let me see if I got her picture there. Oh, there's Lee J. Wait a minute. OK. Oh, we're going to skip this. Where's Charlotte? OK, Charlotte. Charlotte's one of our more experienced agents. And uh, Pender County was voted uh, tie for one of the counties with some of the most unusual submissions to the plant disease and insect clinic. She doesn't realize that, but this is this award. Uh, Dave Stephan and I decided on this uh, yesterday in the clinic. And uh, Pender County was one of the, the counties that won this award. Charlotte doesn't realize that yet. So Charlotte, are you there? I am here. And should I consider uh, that right. an honor? <laughs> uh, I'm, not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But uh, tell us what you have for us today. Well, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that uh, we're seeing around Pender County. And Pender is down in the southeast. And you may have heard of us recently. We have a big forest fire burning in the Holly Shelter Wildlife Reserve. Um, otherwise, Pender County is not in the news much. Um, so that's what's going on in our county. And as far as the coastal plains, the big news horticulturally this spring has been drought. Um, we've had one of the earliest onsetting droughts that I've known. It's not unusual for us to get really dry later in the summer and going into the fall, but we've had one of the driest Mays on record for most of the coastal plain. I know uh, Kinston and New Bern actually set records for the driest May on record. Um, June has not been much better. Uh, the last few weeks, we've seen a few more showers, some areas picking up um, you know, an inch or so of rain. But unfortunately, that's been pretty late for a lot of crops, particularly things like corn and a lot of home vegetable gardens. Um, we've also had a lot of very high temperatures um, up into the 90s, upper 90s. Um, and that's led to a lot of blossom end rot, which is not uncommon. We see a lot of blossom end rot every year. But this year, particularly on squash, I've seen more blossom end rot than I've 
I've ever seen. So in the picture, you've got a nice, normally developing squash. Um, and then you've got some that are that are started to develop, and they're shriveling up on the bottom, um, which is blossom end rot on squash. And then also we have some poor pollination issues where the squash starts to develop and then just shrivels up. Um, so that's been one thing that I've definitely seen a lot of um, in the last couple of months, as well as the blossom end rot showing up on tomatoes and peppers to some extent. Um, and that's a lot of that's been because of the heat and dry weather. Um, the other thing I've seen a lot of is ground pearl. Um, and I think, again, the drought setting in early, particularly in May, which is when I typically get most of the calls about ground pearl. Um, I think more people realize this year they have ground pearl than ever before. And um, I also learned this year that in Pender County and a lot of our coastal counties, we are uh, have two species of ground pearl. Um, so the more common species is a, a rounder, um, almost looks like an osmocote pellet that you find in the soil. Ground pearl are a type of scale, and they feed on grass roots. And people will have big dead areas in their yard where they have these ground pearl. Um, I have noticed that on clay soils, they don't tend to have nearly as dramatic an effect. But in our sandy soils, uh, particularly centipede lawns, it really devastates them. Um, so this rounder species is more common, um, and they're pretty small, so you can see it compared to a dime. But also here at the coast, we have this other species, which is not as perfectly round. They're smaller, and they are glossier. They really do look like pearls, the color of them and the sheen of them. Um, and I talked to Peter Hurdle um, in the entomology department about these, and he's been researching them and said he's only found this, this uh, more pearl-colored species, uh, this smaller, uh, less perfectly round species close to the coast. Um, so if anybody did find those further inland, I know he'd be very interested in hearing about that. Um, but they both cause very similar symptoms. And unfortunately, there's just not anything you can do to get rid of ground pearl. Um, you have to plant something else. And uh, Peter said in a recent study that um, he's still working on publishing, he found that um, zoysia seem to be more resistant, particularly um, El Toro zoysia. Um, but otherwise, trees or shrubs, I don't think this is a real problem in fescue grass, but we don't have fescue lawns uh, here this close to the coast. And with drought, you would think lantana would be a great plant, and it is, um, except for we also have a lot of lantana lace bugs showing up. These are related to the azalea lace bug, and they cause similar symptoms um, as far as that stippling and the leaves looking bronze. But the bad thing on lantana is the plants quit flowering. Once they get these lace bugs on them and the lace bugs start feeding, they just quit flowering altogether. And the edges of the leaves start to turn brown. So they look really bad. They look like they've been burnt, almost. And um, you're growing lantana to look pretty and have nice flowers. Um, so it, I think it tends to cause more than just a cosmetic damage. It's definitely causing more than a cosmetic damage um, on these lantana. Um, and treatment is similar. They are difficult to control. They're here all season and um, have multiple generations. So. The systemic products with Merit work really well. Otherwise, some people have had pretty good luck cutting them back, spraying with soap repeatedly. Um, but it, it really does affect lantana quite severely. Um, and Dave Stephan was telling me that these can also be found on verbena and calicarpa. I've never seen them on either one of those plants, but those are in the same family as lantana. So technically, they could uh, feed on those plants. And I just wanted to end up on a positive note. I have found a plant that loves drought, that's doing exceptionally well, and is very appropriate for July 4th coming up, and that is Fireworks Gomfrina. This is an annual, um, and it's a, a, a more open and airy form of Gomfrina if you're used to growing the shorter, like the buddy globe amaranth. Um, it does exceptionally well in dry weather. I would expect it to stand up quite well to rain as well. We haven't had to test that yet. Um, it reminds me a lot of the Verbena banariensis, except it's more colorful, the flowers are bigger, and it does not get powdery mildew. So this is a great plant um, I would promote as an annual, something a little taller, more airy. Um, 
And the one disadvantage it has is it doesn't look very nice early in the season. It doesn't bloom in, in packs. So I don't think it's going to be one that's going to jump off the garden center shelves. Um, so it might be something we need to promote a little bit because it certainly has performed exceptionally well uh, for me this spring in this very dry weather. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, you. Charlotte. That was great. All right. Now um, we have Amy Rankin is up next. And um, Amy has been an agent for about five years now in horticulture and forestry areas. She's working on her MS degree as we speak. Hopefully we'll receive that soon. And I was interested to find out or to learn that uh, she and her husband are also operated tobacco farms. So she's got lots of great experience and she's been with us before. And I'd like to hear what's happening in Anson County. I'm so glad that they have not um, joined South Carolina instead of North Carolina. So let's find out. Amy, what do you got going on? OK, well, uh, thanks for having me. Um, let's see, this this morning I thought I'd talk about recognizing uh, hydrophobic turf. Um, now we don't see it a whole lot down here. Maybe you know once a year I'll um, submit something to the plant disease and insect clinic, and you know sometimes I'll just see uh, you know a picture like that or something, and, and kind of get tunnel vision, thinking that it's some kind, it's got to be some kind of fungus, but um, only to get the results back and find out it's hydrophobic soils. And um, so I thought this might be a good opportunity opportunity for me to research it a little bit more and um, share some of this information with you on how to recognize that type of situation. Um, some of the physical symptoms you might see um, are localized dry spots um, despite adequate watering. Uh, you'll, you'll see grayish green turf and, and footprinting. Um, so you know, as you walk across the, the turf, you'll notice that the grass blades don't bounce back. Um, and poor growth and erosion. So if the turf isn't getting enough water, it's probably not getting enough nutrients for the limiting growth. And, um, and also, since you've got poor water infiltration, you might see um, increased occurrence of surface water runoff and erosion. Um, all right. All right. Oh, there we go. Um, Dr. Carnock with the University of, of Georgia, these are some of his, well, actually, the, the next slide is going to be some of his photographs. These are from Ohio. But um, Dr. Carnock recommends a simple procedure to rule out some of the other causes for localized dry spots. Um, what he does is c collect intact soil cores about five inches deep from the area in question and allows them to air dry horizontally on a bench for, for several days. And depending on uh, the amount of organic matter you might have in your soil, it could take up to a week. Um, but starting at the top or where the ends of your blade, your grass blades are, he places a um, small drop of water on the surface of the soil in one centimeter increments along the sample. And if the drop does not absorb within 10 seconds, um, he suggests that the, the soil should be considered hydrophobic. And in most cases, he says the water repellency doesn't extend past the top two inches of the soil, though he has seen it um, four inches or, or deeper. Okay. OK, so I, I put contributing conditions here, but maybe what I really meant to say were um, some other possible causes of localized dry spots that you might want to watch out for. Um, excessive thatch, compact soil, um, working a fine textured soil when it's wet, things like that worsen the problem. And in these photographs, I've got some scanning electron micrographs taken from Dr. Carnock's art article in um, the Australian Golf Course Superintendents Association, since I forgot to credit the photo. Um, there's a hydrophobic soil on the left and a normal soil particle on the bottom right. And it, the studies of localized dry spots in turf show that hydrophobic soil particles um, are found to be coated with um, like a, a waxy coating. It's really a, it's a complex organic acid material um, that's just organic matter in its final decomposed state. And it, it just kind of creates a film over that particle 
um, it looks kind of like a mycelium coating or, or something. Um, so when the organic matter dries between rain events on that soil particle, that organic compound becomes very water repellent. And uh, since we don't want to interfere with the normal decomposition of organic matter because we, you know, we've got a lot of other great benefits from that, the most effective management practice for our hydrophobic soils is to use wetting agents or uh, non-ionic surfactants. Um, these products reduce the surface tension of the water and allow the molecules to spread out and um, better penetrate the soil surface and increase the infiltration rate. Um, but it'll only improve the infiltration rates in water repellent soils, so you want to make sure you've got a proper diagnosis. And let's see here, I think I've got another slide here. Um, and there's, there's differences in, in the products. Uh, there's differences like the potential to cause phototoxicity, duration of effectiveness, different formulations. Um, the performance may vary depending on the amount of thatch, uh, the cost, availability of the product. Um, so of, of those products that are available, just you know, check the label to find the one that might best fit the situation at hand. OK, um, well, that's about it. So thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully this information will, will help you to recognize some hydrophobic turf symptoms and, and treat them. And just also keep in mind that these conditions can also be found in nurseries, greenhouses, and open fields in case some of you have responsibilities in ag or commercial or So just keep an eye out on that, too. All right, thank you. Thank you, Amy. That was great. And it really wasn't a dry talk at all. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to move on to uh, Henderson County, and we have Diane Turner, and Diane is an ag and port agent, home board agent. She's been with us before, and uh, Diane, what do you have to tell us today? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, I hope so. Okay, thank you. Um, I thought I would do something a little bit different today. Um, a lot of the master gardeners in the western part of the state have been working really hard since March of 2010, believe it or not, to host the 2012 North Carolina Master Gardener Volunteer Association Conference. So that's a mouthful. Um, we have been working with volunteers from not only Henderson County, but bunk them. And I want to say a special thank you to Linda Blue, too. She's been a great asset on us to work for this conference. Um, Polk County has been helping, as well as Haywood and Transylvania. So Kathy Connors is with me today. She is our volunteer coordinator of this 2012 convention. So we're going to look at some of the photographs from around Asheville, the host site of this conference. And we're just going to talk a little bit about what to expect and hopefully build up some excitement for this conference coming up. This is Kathy Connors. Good morning. As you can tell from the, sl the slide, the 2012 state convention will be held from May 20th through the 23rd. And our location will be in Asheville at the Doubletree Hotel. Um, the city of Asheville as you can tell, is located in the heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, the, uh, um, even though it is May the 20th and most of the azaleas will no longer be in bloom, we hope to catch just a few and it will really um, be totally exciting. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the, even though we will not have this beautiful fall color, um, there will be plenty of opportunity for everyone to um, just do a little bit of sightseeing on their own if they wish to see um, the, the lush green of the springtime in the mountains. Um, uh, uh, there we go. We get a, um, a picture of the Biltmore Estate, which will be one block. Ah, we will be, the Double Tree Hotel will be one block from the entrance to the Biltmore Estate. And the springtime will just be popping. Um, another uh, look at downtown Asheville, um, the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains in the background. 
and there will be plenty of opportunities for us to um, catch a trolley from the hotel and do a little bit of shopping, a little bit of eating. Everybody can have a great time. Um, cloud cover, but hardly any at that time of the year. And outdoor activities will abound, including river rafting and hiking if you so choose. Um, but the most spectacular is just to jump into your car and um, to hop onto the Blue Ridge Parkway and take a look-see. There's that uh, river rafting opportunity. And um, of course, nightlife will abound. So um, after the conference is over, you can catch that trolley again and head downtown and pick up um, some after um, some libations. Um, the entrance to the um, estate, as I mentioned, is only a block away. And right across the street uh, from the Double Tree is the historic Biltmore Village. Many of the structures in the village built at the same time as the Biltmore Estate include a church, a train station, and support staff housing. Boutiques, restaurants, and other shopping venues now bound in those places. And um, again, we want to invite you to the 2012 conference, May 20th through May 23rd. It is only a moment away. All right, well, that's it for us. Um, we hope to see everybody next May in 2012. Thanks so much. All right, Diane. Well, it sounds like it's a, going to be a good meeting and certainly an excellent location for all involved who are heading up that way. Okay. Oh, we have another picture there. I'm looking for David Orr is our featured speaker this morning, and David is David is our professor here, and he is an expert in biological control of insect pests and organic IPM. He teaches classes on those subjects, and he's also interested in and does work with invasive pests. So David's going to talk to us today, and he will leave some time for questions. If you do have questions, you can raise your hand, or you can type them in the box and we'll try to get to them either during or at the end of the presentation. So, David, um, take it away. What have you got for us? Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, can everybody hear me? I'm, I'm assuming they can. I can hear you. That's OK, important. good. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to talk about beneficial insects today. And I'm going to talk about uh, something called um, natural control. And Steve, I'm trying to forward my slides, but I can't seem to get that to happen. OK. Uh, oh, there we, there we go. Right. Perfect. OK. okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, identifying beneficial insects, uh, the value that they provide, and uh, how to encourage them. And one of the main things I'm going to focus on is, is something called natural control. I, I want to distinguish that from, from biological control. And that will make sense in a little bit as I go through these slides. Well, this first slide is, is, a, is a still image, but it's really a, a surprisingly action-filled slide. And I'm going to explain that here uh, in, in this slide, showing you um, what most of you would recognize if you've grown tomatoes in your, your yard or, or been associated with other um, solanaceous crops. This is the tobacco hornworm, the most common hornworm you find in tomatoes. And it's been attacked by this little parasitic wasp up here, a little braconid wasp. And what's happened is that wasp has laid a bunch of eggs inside of that caterpillar, injected them really quickly. And um, those eggs hatch out into par uh, parasitic insect larvae, parasitoid larvae. And they're called parasitoids um, because they're parasitic insects that kill their host. And I'll show you how that happens. After they're done feeding inside this caterpillar feeding on non-essential organs, they will begin chewing their way out of the caterpillar. And you can see right here, this is the head of one of those uh, parasite larvae or parasitoid larvae uh, poking out of a hole that it chewed. 
and they squeeze their way out of the, the caterpillar like toothpaste. Right on the rear end here, you can see one squeezing uh, out. And uh, once they've squeezed their way out of the caterpillar, they'll reform their body shape that's kind of grub-like on the outside of the caterpillar and, and then begin forming a, a silk cocoon around themselves. And that's what these white masses are here. They're cocoons um, with uh, pupating parasitoids inside of them. So in about another week, those um, parasitoids will emerge as fully formed adult wasps and go off uh, to find more hornworms. So what this caterpillar is right here is a, a basically a nursery right now for parasitic wasp uh, larvae and pupae. And so that's a great thing to have in your garden. A lot of people have identified those. They're easy to see compared to the, the um, non-parasitized hornworm. And so some people have uh, pulled them up. But they're a great thing to leave in the garden. Um, so that's a little bit of an introduction to uh, parasitic insects. I'm going to talk a little bit about natural control now. And to talk about that, I need to uh, reiterate how insects affect uh, almost every part of our daily lives. They affect what we eat, like this corn borer larva in the corn, uh, where we live. Here's some trees killed by pine beetles that are going to be an expense for that homeowner. And they affect how we live. Um, not many people would choose to live in an area with this many mosquitoes. Um, so with the, all these bugs everywhere, how, how come we're not covered in them? Uh, you can do calculations with uh, the common house fly, for example, where you put two of them together, they mate, and, and literally within four months, theoretically, they will cover the entire United States knee deep in flies. That's how quickly they reproduce. Now that doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because of something called natural control. And that's basically the maintaining of population densities within limits by the actions of uh, either non-biological or biological environmental factors. And so what are these en environmental factors that keep these populations within uh, their limits? They're physical factors, like weather. Uh, cold winters will reduce insect populations. Food, the quality and quantity of food. Competition between and, and among species um, will limit populations, as will the limitations um, uh, provided by space or territory. And finally, one of uh, a number of factors in natural control are these beneficial insects. And this natural control that goes on with, with whether we're involved with it or not, or even aware of it, is uh, tremendous. Here's the value in the US every year from natural control of only native insect pests. So $13.5 billion. So of that, um, if you look at the value of natural control provided by predators and parasitic insects, or parasitoids, it's about four and a half billion dollars. So a significant contribution without people doing anything. Uh, these uh, predators and parasitoids are out there attacking pest insects regardless of, of whether we have anything to do with it. Now when we take part in this and, and, and um, raise predators, for example, to release on, on crops or, or horticultural uh, crops, um, that's when uh, it's called biological control. So this natural control has a variety of organisms that are involved. I'm going to begin with the predators. And predators, in their simplest definition, are, are insects that eat many prey in their lifetime. They're not picky eaters. They're usually larger than their prey, like this uh, predatory stink bug nymph here, uh, sucking the life out of a, a helpless caterpillar. And uh, this, this predatory stink bug has injected digestive enzymes into that caterpillar to subdue it. And, and that's a, uh, this is a, a, an example of, of where the predator can be larger than the prey or the same sized nymph uh, attacking a much, much larger insect. This is uh, kind of uncommon. But um, this uh, predatory stink bug nymph has uh, subdued a great big catalpa worm. And it's done that by injecting these uh, digestive enzymes that, that uh, uh, pretty much kill the caterpillar. And then the bug will suck out the partly digested material. So there's a variety of uh, uh, insect groups 
that can be predators, um, and we're going to go through each of these right now, and I'll give you a few brief examples of these and how to identify some of them and how to encourage them. Here are, are two uh, native lady beetles, the convergent lady beetle, and this is one that some of you may be familiar with if you've purchased lady beetles in the past. This is the primary species that, that is sold commercially, but it's also one of our most abundant native lady beetles. The other is the, the 12 spotted lady beetle. It's kind of a, an unusual looking lady beetle. It's sort of oval shaped and, and often pink or pinky red. Um, but both of these are very, very common native lady beetles. Uh, I've also got an example of two um, exotic species, C7 um, or Coleum agilla septum punctata, seven spots. Uh, it's from uh, Europe and was introduced purposely um, by the USDA years ago uh, with no specific target in mind other than just aphids. And uh, then the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And you can see this insect leaves up to its name. It, it ranges in color all the way from plain orange or yellowy to um, orange or red with many, many spots. And uh, these are both exotic species that have been shown to displace uh, native species, um, and in some cases become, uh, like the, with multicolored Asian species, a, a major pest problem in, in houses in some cases. Um, so what do these ladybugs all have in common? They all look something like this when they're larvae, kind of spiny little alligators that are often associated with um, aphids. If you have aphids, you'll probably find these in the same place. When they pupate, they look like this. And this is kind of a curious looking insect. It almost looks like a scale insect, but if you look closely, the lady beetle has shed the larval skin. And so the legs and the skin of the body are kind of uh, like circling the base of the, of the pupa. And the pupa has got kind of a humped back to it. And they uh, usually pick uh, uh, the undersides of leaves to, to pupate on, but they can also pupate in the tops of leaves. And people have mistaken these for Colorado potato beetle larvae in the past. But um, if you look closely enough, you'll see that uh, shed skin around the base of the, of the pupa. Well, how do you encourage lady beetles? Um, if you have aphids, basically, they will come. And uh, some people have tried uh, releasing lady beetles. There, there are uh, a, um, a number of companies that sell lady beetles for release. But you have to, to buy a, an incredibly large number of lady beetles to have any significant impact in the landscape. The uh, studies that have been done with releasing lady beetles have shown that it takes about 1,500 lady beetles released to control uh, insects like aphids on one shrub. And so if you're going to try to treat your entire yard or a nursery, uh, that would be an awful lot of lady beetles. The other thing is the studies have shown that over 95% of the lady beetles leave within 24 hours of release. They're gone. And, um, uh, they, and typically, they will not lay eggs either to reproduce. So, so purchasing lady beetles, unless you're in kind of an enclosed environment, uh, can be a little tricky in terms of, of getting an effective release. So encouraging them. Uh, something that Steve has talked about for years is spot treating or um, treating only when needed. Keeping a few aphids around if they're not hurting your plant um, might be beneficial. <coughs> well, the next uh, group of beetles are the ground beetles. And they, they range in size from this uh, callosoma over an inch long uh, to this um, a uh, uh, weed seed feeding beetle a uh, half an inch long, all the way down to a quarter of an inch or less. And they, they vary in their, their shape and size and color. Um, but they all have this characteristic in common, this kind of jelly bean looking structure at the base of their hind legs. And so you can turn them over to figure out if that is, in fact, a ground beetle. Ground beetles are really common and have varied diets that, and can be really beneficial in a variety of different settings. Here's an example of, of a ground beetle eating a weed seed, a very common activity for a lot of ground beetles. Here's another one that is a specialist on Colorado potato beetle eggs and larvae. And these will crawl up onto plants at night, uh, feeding on, on insects up on the plants. 
Typically the larvae kind of look like this. They have uh, big mandibles, uh, kind of worm-like body, and often these uh, uh, structures at the very uh, end of the, of the abdomen, kind of big spiny uh, looking structures. They look kind of scary, but they, they won't bite you. Uh, they're only interested in attacking other insects. And they can be very, very common either on the ground or um, up on plants, but typically ground beetles are, are active at nighttime, and so people don't often see them unless you turn over soil or, or a log or a, a rock or whatever during the daytime. Now a special kind of tiger, uh, a kind of a ground beetle is the, the tiger beetle. And if you have a patio or a, a, a open bare area, um, or uh, even a sidewalk sometimes, you'll, you'll often find these tiger beetles haunting and they'll run and, and fly very, very quickly. In fact, they're one of the fastest running insects, if not the fastest, in the insect world. And, and it's been said that they, they can run faster than their visual system can keep up with. So they, they sometimes have to stop and let their vision catch up with them. They move so quickly. And their larvae uh, look like this fearsome uh, uh, insect here with great big wide mandibles for grasping insects that walk by their tunnels. And you can typically uh, pick out their tunnels because they're perfectly round and they have kind of a funnel shape to the top. Very, very regular, very even and smooth. And these larvae um, inhabit the tunnels with their head, their big flat head at the top, and uh, their bodies have these uh, protruding knobs on the soft body to hold them in place in the tunnel. And they'll grab um, insects that happen to walk by, anything they can subdue, and drag it down into the, the tunnel and feed on them. There's a variety of other insects that make tunnels, but, but uh, very few that have the perfectly round funnel shape at the top. OK, on to another beetle that uh, most or all of you have seen before, a soldier beetle. The adults will get onto flowers and eat pollen. Very, very common. This is, um, uh, there's a variety around here called the Pennsylvania leatherwing. And um, there's a variety of other species. Their larvae, though, are, are something you're not typically going to see, because they'll come out at night. They're, they're associated with the soil um, uh, during the day. And at night, they will crawl up onto plants and have been reported as very common predators of uh, plant-dwelling insects at nighttime. So they're one of the, the night crew. Uh, so uh, often you'll see these adult soldier beetles um, at, uh, uh, on, on flowers. If you have a big perennial bed of flowers, uh, sometimes they can get really abundant. They're not feeding on the flowers at all. They're only feeding on the pollen a little bit. And um, uh, uh, they um, aren't harming the flowers at all. So uh, a beneficial insect, even though um, they can be in, in pretty good numbers sometimes. Hoverflies. Here's another um, uh, great fly. This uh, particular hoverfly has coloration that mimics a, a wasp. And, and they sometimes mimic wasps or bees to gain protection from their own predators. But uh, you can tell a hoverfly because uh, of a variety of characteristics, like these great big eyes that circle around the head. Uh, they t have two wings. And uh, if you don't see them still close up on a, on a leaf like this, um, they'll be hovering, living up to their name. And, and they can get very curious. They hover around you, around flowers. Um, and so a, an insect that looks like a wasp or a bee that hovers a lot is probably a hoverfly. So the adults feed on, on nectar and flowers. Um, the larvae uh, look like maggots, like this here, often very camouflaged, mixed in with um, aphid colonies. And they have hook-like mouth parts that they jab into aphids and, and suck the, the body contents out with. So hoverflies, um, encouraging hoverflies, basically, typically involves uh, 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 leaving some aphids so that they can feed on them. There are some growers that uh, have taken to planting um, sweet alyssum out in California, large uh, strips of sweet alyssum, to try to encourage uh, hoverflies to feed on aphids in their crops. Uh, on to paper wasps. Uh, paper wasps, um, you know, most of us know these as a stinging insect. 
they're an incredibly uh, valuable predator of caterpillars. Here's a, a caterpillar that this paper wasp has killed and chewed up and rolled into a ball, and it's going to carry it back to its nest. And uh, I've seen these insects kill caterpillars that are bigger than they can carry in one load, and they will cut the caterpillar in half and uh, roll up one half in a ball and carry it back to the nest and then fly back to exactly the same spot and, and find the remainder of that caterpillar and take it back to the nest. Incredible ability to, to navigate. But these are great predators of, of caterpillars. People have researched them in the past here at NC State for control of, of agricultural caterpillars with some success, except the management of the nest boxes uh, turned out to be a little bit uh, difficult. Uh, how do you encourage these? Well, typically, um, if you see a nest in an area that you're not going to interact with, it's, you're not, they're not bothering you, you're not bothering them, it's probably fine to just leave that nest and, and they'll go about their business uh, munching on caterpillars. Um, you could also consider planting some flowers that are, are very helpful to them. And, and the paper wasps, not necessarily, but uh, other predatory wasps benefit from, from uh, these two plants in particular. If you want to see a lot of predatory wasps in your yard, um, planting mountain mint, uh, a native North Carolina plant, or Aurelia spinosa, a Tennessee walking stick, um, will produce flowers that are just magnets for predatory wasps and pollinators. And um, all three of these wasps will appear on the flowers. The scoliaid wasp here is uh, uh, often referred to as a, a parasitic wasp of, of grubs in, in lawns. But I threw it in here because it, it is very, very common on these two two flowers. So if you want to encourage a lot of native insects, native predators, and, and pollinators, and uh, butterflies, swallowtail butterflies in particular, love the flowers on this Aurelia spinosa. Um, uh, two great plants for uh, attracting and feeding uh, predatory wasps and pollinators. Well, I wanted to mention uh, another uh, kind of curiosity. Um, predator, the Carolina mantid. I want to point out here, the Carolina mantid can be either gray, brown, or, or green, but um, the way you tell it apart is its wings only cover about three quarters of its body. They end before they get to the end of the abdomen here. Whereas in the uh, non-native uh, exotic species like the Chinese mantid, the wings will always extend um, the full length of the abdomen. And uh, the Chinese mantids uh, actually are, are uh, I would consider them an exotic invasive pest because they do eat um, uh, pretty much anything that crosses their path. They're not targeting insects that we consider to be pests. They don't go after the, the mites, the, the thrips, um, and mites are not insects, of course, but they're arthropods, um, aphids, caterpillars. They instead are ambush predators, so they wait for anything to cross their path. And it might be a, a bumblebee. Um, it might be a hummingbird. It might be a snake. I've got video, and, and um, uh, uh, we weren't able to show it today, but uh, of a Chinese mantis attacking uh, and eating a snake, and uh, the same thing with a hummingbird. So they can be a problem in some areas where Hummingbirds uh, migrate, and they're in higher higher numbers. They'll they've learned to get onto the hummingbird feeders, and uh, and snatch the hummingbirds out of the out of midair. Uh, so I would consider these an exotic invasive pest. Uh, green lacewings, uh, the lacewings in general, um, very important predators of aphids and a variety of other insects. Um, the adults are very attractive. Uh, in this case, it's a green-bodied insect with coppery eyes and, and clear net-like wings. And the adults can be predaceous in some cases, in other cases not, depending on the species. And these are sold commercially for, for um, management of, of, of insect pests. The larvae uh, are often called uh, uh, aphid lions. And they're, they're kind of alligator-like like the lady beetles, but they don't have the spiny colored uh, spines on the back. Um, the spines are off to the side with them. And they're, they have more of a tapered look than the lady beetle. And they also have these long pincer-like mouth parts um, on the, off the head that they use for sucking 
the life out of um, poor little aphids. But very, very um, can be effective predators of aphids. Uh, here's what their eggs look like. Their eggs are laid on these stalks to prevent predation and uh, cannibalism. They will feed on, on one another uh, when they emerge. And so that provides a little bit of protective mechanism. Again, encouraging them, leaving a few aphids behind. If you don't have high numbers that are causing damage of, of aphids, you may want to spot treat the areas that are causing problems, higher numbers, and leave a few behind. And you can encourage populations of these. Assassin bugs, um, these are predatory bugs that have this kind of funny shaped head with a short curved beak can be, in some cases, common predators. They have a variety of shapes and sizes, but they always have this funny elongated head with um, the short curved beak. <clears throat> Their nymphs uh, can look kind of spider-like sometimes, but again, that, that characteristic head with the beak gives them away. Uh, the eggs are kind of barrel-shaped like this with a white top. Here's one squeezing itself out of the egg as it hatches, um, and then the legs and so forth will spread out, kind of like squeezing itself out of a tube of toothpaste, and then forming its body shape on the outside, kind of like that parasitic wasp I showed you earlier. Predatory stink bugs. There's a variety of predatory stink bugs. This is the most common one that you might encounter, the uh, spined soldier bug. And um, the way you can tell them apart from plant feeding stink bugs is the beak is always really, really thick in comparison to the antenna, whereas the beak on a plant feeding stink bug is going to be very, very thin compared to uh, the antennae. Uh, OK, so I see a question here. Fairly certain I've seen assassin bug larvae feed on tomatoes in the past few years. What you've probably seen are um, a group of, of insects called leaf-footed bugs that look very, very similar to assassin bugs. But again, if you look at the head, uh, the head is not elongate um, like in the assassin bug, and the beak is going to be long and narrow. Um, well, uh, I guess I would recommend uh, sending a, a picture or a specimen into the, the clinic so somebody can I identify um, that insect for you. Sometimes these, these uh, predatory bugs will feed on, on um, plants, but, but not very commonly, and, and definitely not at the level where they cause damage. OK, here's uh, the nymphs often look kind of flattened and round, and uh, they'll feed the same way as the adults. The eggs often um, plant feeding uh, stink bugs are going to be lined up geometrically perfectly in, in rows, like this southern green stink bug egg mass. Whereas the predatory stink bugs are kind of irregular in the way they lay their eggs down, and their eggs often have spiny tops to them. Here's another uh, predatory bug, um, the insidious flower bug, a big name for a very tiny little insect, uh, less than an eighth of an inch long. Uh, often has this, or well, typically has this diamond-shaped pattern on the back. They will bite, and their bite can be pretty significant. It can feel like you're, you've been stung by something. They're very, very common and, and can be very effective predators of thrips and other small, uh, soft-bodied insects. And they're sold commercially. The nymphs uh, look kind of like an orange teardrop with uh, red eyes. And they're uh, also very common. So uh, be aware that that's something that could be mixed up with a plant-feeding insect. So red eyes and orange. Uh, teardrop-shaped body, that's insidious flower bug. OK, well, onto the parasitic insects. Um, as I said before, uh, parasitic insects in, in entomology jargon have been called parasitoids because they kill their host. And uh, each one will eat at most one insect host in a lifetime. And often, there's many more, like on this um, hornworm here. They're very picky eaters. And they're typically the same size or smaller than their host. And they attack all host life stages. And there's only a few types of insects that are parasitoids, mainly the wasps. There's some flies and a few beetles. And uh, I'm going to uh, give you a, a brief introduction, very brief introduction to uh, some of the life history of these parasitoids to let you know that some of them are what are called endoparasitoids. That means they're laying eggs inside of the insect they're attacking. 
uh, like this uh, wasp laying its egg into a tomato fruit worm, or this little wasp laying its egg into a tomato fruit worm egg. <clears throat> As opposed to ectoparasitoids, they will paralyze their host uh, before laying eggs on or, or near the host. And here's an example of some grubs that are um, on the outside of a, a caterpillar. Typically, uh, ectoparasitoids attack insects that are concealed. This particular wasp here is using its egg laying device to uh, drill through about uh, uh, an inch or two of wood, solid wood, uh, and paralyzing a caterpillar and then laying uh, an egg on or, or near it. And it can drill. It's hard to believe that something that thin and frail looking could drill through wood. But when these things uh, develop, they selectively lay down metals in that egg laying device. So it's basically like a little knife that they can um, uh, jab into the, the, uh, the wood and work it through. So the two kinds of parasitoids. Um, so how do you tell when they're present? They're usually extremely tiny. And I tried to get these as small as I could, but I couldn't get them any smaller in comparison to this ruler. But um, some of these insects are almost microscopic. And so what you have to do is look for the clues they leave behind. And uh, luckily, they do leave uh, pretty obvious clues. When parasitoids attack insect eggs, uh, luckily for entomologists, they turn the eggs black every time, very, very distinctive black compared to eggs that have hatched that are going to be clear and, and often eaten by the, the caterpillar that emerges from them. Uh, when they attack larvae, uh, often you won't be able to tell anything has happened until a, a week or more later when, in this case, the parasitoid larva has completely consumed the insides of that caterpillar, chewed a hole near the head, and, and emerged and spun a cocoon on a leaf. And so you can see these cocoons stuck to, to leaves uh, in crop plants or, or horticultural uh, plants. Uh, aphid parasitoids, like this little wasp here that's bent its body completely in half, so it's injecting uh, an egg into this aphid. After about five or so days, uh, that aphid will uh, turn into what we call a mummy, M-U-M-M-Y, basically a husk of, of an aphid uh, where the um, uh, parasitoid will pupate inside of it. Uh, often you'll see these uh, mummies associated with uh, living aphids. So here's some green aphids on the leaves. And then uh, uh, mummies that uh, clearly are, are parasitized. Here's a little parasitic wasp walking around the leaf. And so that indicates that probably a lot of those green aphids are already parasitized. Sometimes when you look at pupae, you can see little holes in the pupae that are too small for, in this case, the fly or whatever it happens to be to get out. That means the pupae have been parasitized. And in some cases, uh, parasitoids will leave clues behind on adults they parasitize. Here's a, an egg laid by this parasitic cachinid fly. And that egg hatches out into a larva that burrows inside the, the stink bug, in this case, and keeps it from reproducing. And so if you see an egg on a stink bug like that, that indicates that that's basically a nursery for a, a sink bug parasitoid, a good thing to have around. OK, well, how do you encourage these parasitoids? I, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but I will tell you, I give you one example. That tobacco hornworm uh, we talked about, the little wasp, will, uh, when tobacco hornworms aren't around, there are other native species that will attack, including the, the snowberry clearwing. That's this uh, really attractive moth that um, produces a larva that can be parasitized by, the, by this little braconid wasp. Uh, also, the great ash stinks on uh, ash and lilac. Uh, and uh, Pandora stinks on things like Virginia creeper and, and wild grape. So this example shows that it, it's valuable to keep native vegetation around. Um, because uh, having a lot of native insects, and in this case, the parasitoid is a native insect, um, will encourage uh, populations. A lot of people and a lot of articles have been written about flowers being planted to encourage parasitic insects. And the, the research on this is kind of mixed. It's not really clear yet. There are no really good recommendations that can be made for specific 
flowers that can be planted to encourage specific parasitoids. Very, very few examples because there's a lot of things to consider. You don't want to plant flowers that are also going to encourage um, uh, plant feeding insects. And in some cases, uh, the parasitic insects may not be able to feed on certain types of flowers. Uh, a, lot, a lot of complications here. It's turned out to be a lot more complicated to come up with specific flower recommendations. One thing I can say, though, is that the honeydew produced by insects like, uh, like aphids or um, tree hoppers or scales um, often uh, gets dribbled or sprayed onto plants. And, and it turns out that these parasitic wasps uh, in almost every case, if you pulled a parasitic wasp out of the field, it will have a signature of, of carbohydrates from this honeydew. And so having a few of these insects around, these plant feeding insects, producing honeydew can actually be beneficial to encouraging parasitic insects. So you don't want to try and kill all of them unless they're causing damage or at a level where they're going to cause damage. Um, you may want to try, uh, consider spot treating and keep some of them around because they will provide an alternate food source. And so uh, it looks like I've got about a minute and a half left. I'm going to wrap that talk up. If anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them now. OK, are there any questions out there? If you have a question, uh, you could raise your hand or type it into the box. I'm going to assume we have some slow typers. So I'll give you give it another <laughs> second or two. Um, I'm not sure that I'm going to leave a, a whole lot of scale insects around to produce honeydew, but um, can't kill them all. Okay, David, there's a question for you. Are there flowers that attract predatory insects? Uh, yes, there are, but um, uh, there's an example. One example that's been studied pretty well was the use of, of sunflowers to try to encourage populations of uh, the insidious flower bug, that little aureus um, bug that I showed you earlier. The, the trouble with that is um, they really, really, really like sunflowers, and they'll stay in the sunflowers, and they won't move back to uh, your crop plant. and so. Uh, they end up being a, tra a trap crop for the little insidious flower bugs. And so uh, again, uh, we've still got a lot of work to do to try to um, uh, figure out what flowers could be planted for even encouraging uh, uh, predatory insects. Okay, David. That was, a, that was a good question. David, I tell the master gardeners all the time to try for diversity in their landscape and to have something flowering as much of the time as they can, and also different types of habitat from turf to uh, ground covers to low shrubs and, and uh, understory trees, etc. cetera. Um, how, what's the, uh, can you support what I've been telling these people for all these years? A absolutely. Diversity is, is a key. If you want to get diversity in your beneficial insect population, you need diversity in your plant population. So you're absolutely right, Steve. And, and, and uh, considering native plants as well in your landscape can also enhance um, beneficials, native beneficials, by enhancing uh, native plant feeding um, insect populations. Uh, so you're exactly right. The diversity is, is one of the keys. OK, Carolyn has a question about uh, her tie tie. And I guess she lives down the coast somewhere. Uh, and it's covered with insects. If you are, are familiar with that or what might be on that, and she's wondering if tai tai is a, a good plant for some of these parasitic wasps. Well, I, I actually have to say I, I don't know what a tai tai plant is. Uh, I'm, so, I'm but, assuming but, that Cerulea, Racinoflora, is going to be my guess to impress everybody if I'm recalling it correctly. Uh, it is more in the coastal area. Uh, and I do see, I haven't seen it lately because I haven't been down there while it's blooming, but I do see lots of things on it. And uh, yes, it's, you know, it's in the and stuff. So um, 
I'm going to answer for David and just say that, yes, there's a lot of uh, things on it. Uh, bees actually will also visit it. So I think that it couldn't be bad for the, the beneficials. Yeah, I have been, and when I've been in the Pocosin swamps, um, I've noted uh, some of the flowers in there that are really attractive to, um, to bees, native pollinators. But that doesn't mean that parasitic insects aren't in there. Typically, though, if you're finding pollinators, very long-tongued insects, and the parasitic wasps don't have long tongues, and so they probably don't share uh, the same um, plant food hosts. All right. Thank you. Let's all give David a round of applause with your clapping hands, if you can. That was a very beneficial uh, talk. And David, if you are able to hang around, uh, it'd be great in case we get some questions later. But uh, absolutely, if you, yeah. if you need to take off, we understand that too. And I'll stick around. All right, great. Now um, we have Mark Blevins from Gaston County, and Mark has been with us also earlier in other broadcasts, Illuminate broadcasts, and she's he is going to tell us about one of the showstopper plants for this month. Mark, what do you got? Thanks a lot. Steve Bambera, everybody. Hey, so Showstopper Plants is a great program from statewide nominations by nurserymen selected by some of your fellow agents across the state so that these plants are great showstoppers in just about anybody's garden. They're highlighted at some of the spring and garden shows throughout the state, so take a look at them there if they're not nearby you. Hey, we, oh, speaking of you, we'll talk about one of those shortly. You can find out more at the Extension Gardener site. Yay. Hey, let's look at those plants and we'll highlight the Coosa Dogwood today. The Winter Series Camellia, as the name implies, these are very cold hardy and would do great in the mountains, but also in warmer spots too. Global warming might not make it as big of a deal, but hey, until then, plant a winter series camellia. Climbing hydrangea, oh, four seasons of interest with that peeling bark, and you may have heard them referred to as hydrangeums. I sure have, but this is the hydrangea. <laughs> it's a climbing one at that. How fun. You can lime it, you can sulfur it, but it won't turn colors. This one's white. Hey, Japanese plum you. Oh, this is the Prostrata variety, so it stays low. It looks great on its own or in a group or in a mass planting. You just can't go wrong with Japanese plum you, as long as you give it a little bit of shade, especially early on. The Venus sweet shrub. You'll have to do your own painting with a small, tiny miniature goddess there and clamshell, but this is a great sweet shrub, and it's white flowered. Oh, how fun. Surprise and shock your friends and neighbors and fellow gardeners with this great sweet shrub. We're going to talk about the Coosa dogwood real quick. So what a great plant. And the fruits are edible. You can't go wrong with this one. It flowers later than our native. So you can extend your bloom time by planting this one. Oh, it's so wonderful. There's a couple of name varieties out there. But you just can't go wrong with this show stopper, Coosa dogwood. Hey, thanks, everybody. Okay, Mark, thanks a lot. And Barbara has uh, posted the URL for getting a little more information on the showstopper plants. If you all would like to visit that and find out a little bit more, or you could also email Mark. I'm sure he would be happy to give you some more information. Okay, now we are going to move to the, our David Stephan, who has been with us for so many years, I can't even count them, and uh, just the steadfast part. And this is going to be a really big talk, I have a, a, a sneaking suspicion. So David, if you are there, tell us what you're seeing out there at this time of the year. Well, uh, thank you, Steve, and uh, especially thank you, Dave Orr. That was uh, you're, that's a very tough act to follow with, uh, you know, all those great images and the great information you had there about predatory and parasitoid insects. 
Uh, I had to step out a couple of times, so I don't know if you made if Dave made this point, but when you're selecting native wildflowers, if you want to try and encourage uh, parasites and predators to hang around your garden, uh, don't necessarily think that the larger flowered ones are going to be better because um, oftentimes uh, plants with tiny flowers are extremely attractive to pollinators or parasitoids. Uh, you can't you can't always tell just by the look. Okay, uh, but moving on here. As uh, some of you who have uh, listened to these presentations in years past, I've referred to June as Big Bug Month because this is the time of year when some of our largest and showiest and um, most golly gosh insects are out there and active. So I'm going to be featuring some big bugs throughout this presentation along with some other things that have come into the clinic in the last few weeks. And I'm going to start off with the eyed click beetle or eyed elater. Elaus oculatus, which is our largest species of click beetle in North Carolina. And this is a, uh, an insect that uh, sometimes will fly to lights at night, but uh, more often you're going to find it when you're peeling dead bark on logs and trees. The, uh, the eye spots, and uh, excuse me, Steve, where, uh, Mike, where is the pointer on this thing? That's bad. All right. A little technical issue here. Um, straightening it out. All right. You're going to grab the. That right there. You can choose what you want. Any arrow. Arrow? Yeah. Okay, no clicking. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I should have done this in advance. Okay, these eye spots on the on the prothorax, uh, it, these aren't actually eyes, of course, but these are mats of fine black hairs uh, ringed by white hairs. And presumably to a predator like a bird or a lizard, this might resemble the head of something, possibly a snake, something else. Anyway, presumably uh, it has some benefit in scaring off potential predators. But the, uh, as I said, this species is most likely going to be found under the bark of logs, um, hardwood logs in the case of Alaus oculatus. We also have a second species of eyed quick beetle here in North Carolina, Alaus myops, which is a little smaller on average and tends to be a little more brown in color. And you're going to find that species under the bark of dead pine logs or under the bark of standing dead pine trees. Now, we, I got this one to play dead. Um, well, OK, actually, it was dead. And I'll be honest about that. But the ability of click beetles to click is probably a good defense against predators. They have fairly hard shells on their bodies. They're a thick uh, exoskeleton. And if a bird or, or even a human tries to grab one of these things and he starts clicking, they can just uh, slip right out of your fingers. They're almost slippery. They're so slick and their, their shells are so hard. Uh, it's also possible that the clicking activity may startle a predator. A bird or, or something tries to grab one of these things, and all of a sudden it clicks and it goes, whoa, and drops it, and the beetle gets away. But if you catch a live click beetle sometime, try holding it by the, uh, the abdomen between your fingers and, and see how quickly it can slip out when it starts clicking. Of course, if a beetle falls on a smooth surface like this, lands on its back, it can use this click to bounce in the air a couple of inches. And after one or two tries, it will end up on its feet again. Now, the clicking mechanism itself is between two structures on the underside of the thorax. If you've got a click that I can't see. I'm sorry. you got a click on the click. Uh, OK. Uh, there is this uh, heavy spine projecting forward. Now, the, the head of the beetle is toward the left side of the picture here. Uh, you've got this heavy spine which projects forward from the underside of the mesothorax and fits into this deep cavity on the hind margin of the prothorax of the beetle. And when the beetle wants to click, it will tip its thorax, its prothorax downward, and the spine will slip into and engage a sort of a latch device inside this cavity. And then it will tilt its prothorax back, increase tension until finally the spine snaps out and you get this, this sudden snap. Kind of like a little clicker toy that uh, kids play with or that dog trainers use to get the attention of a dog. Uh, and uh, it, just, it produces an audible snapping sound in addition to the, the, snap, the jumping of the beetle itself. Uh, the larval stage of these eyed elaters can be two and a half, almost three inches long. And uh, unlike the larvae of most other species of um, wireworms or click beetles in North Carolina, the larvae of alaus are predators. Now, most other 
species of cliff beetles, larvae are, are plant feeders, they feed on roots, they bore in plants, and many of them are of considerable economic importance. But uh, these alouts are predators, and uh, they can be found in the dead wood feeding on insects there. And they don't inject the venom or toxic saliva uh, when they grab their prey. They simply just grab it in their heavy mandibles and start chewing on it. And uh, this can be a very effective technique. Uh, many years ago, I was holding one of these in my hand while, while talking to a grower. And the thing proceeded to try and chew its way out of my hand. And uh, I had a long moment to decide whether to drop the thing or, or just try to ignore the pain. But finally, the dropping one out, and I lost the, uh, the larva. OK, um, when the predators, uh, I, Dave might have mentioned, uh, say, robber flies in his talk. We have many species of robber flies here in North Carolina, probably over 100 different species, uh, ranging in size from no more than a quarter inch long to over an inch long in some cases. It's a large group. It occurs worldwide. And the adults are predators on other insects. Uh, most of them are not very picky about what they feed on, anything in the right size range, although some species of robber flies do seem to prefer a certain kind of prey. But usually the, the robber fly will take up position somewhere on a leaf or on a log or some of them just on the ground and sit there and wait until they see something that looks good and the right size range fly by, and then they'll take off and, and chase after it and hunt it down. Unfortunately, some species of robber flies become pests around honeybee hives. They'll actually perch on the hive and just pick off worker bees as they come and go. So that's not cool. But uh, otherwise, we regard them as beneficial insects. The uh, larvae of robber flies uh, live in soil or in rotten logs, where they are also predators, feeding on other insects that live there. And uh, hey, let's face it, don't we all enjoy it when we see something eating a Japanese beetle, as this Lafria species robber fly is doing? Uh, another one of our big bugs here in June is the giant water bug. And we actually have three different species of this uh, Lephosaurus water bug here in North Carolina. Unfortunately, uh, these are images we're sent in. I can't be certain of which of the three species we've got. Um, but adults are from two to two and a half inches long. They can fly very well. And sometimes, if you've got a light source close to a water body, like a ditch or a pond where they're abundant, they may come flying into the lights in large numbers. And uh, we have a few uh, additional genera of giant water bugs that are only an inch long. And they have a very uh, unusual reproductive behavior. This is very unusual among insects and other arthropods for the male to take any significant role in reproduction other than simply uh, inseminating the female. But with these smaller giant water bugs, the female will lay her eggs on the male's back, and he will carry them around until they hatch. So this is a pretty good protection, actually, because not too many other predators are going to want to take on a giant water bug as a, as a potential prey item. Uh, so the eggs are well protected by the male. I'm not sure how much he has to say about this, but it, uh, it's a system that seems to work pretty well for them. Now, the uh, adults are aquatic. Uh, and they're usually found in ponds and lakes and dishes, ditches, places where the water is slow and the vegetation is thick. They may also be hiding in the sediments uh, at the bottom of the pond. So if you're walking around there and step on one of these things, he's not going to appreciate it and will let you know that. Now, like most other uh, aquatic hemipterans, the, uh, they are predators. They can feed on or mostly on other insects, but they are also known to feed on small fish, tadpoles, small frogs as well. And they are notoriously uh, aggressive. Uh, they have quite an attitude, and they are not at all shy about biting. Uh, personally, I've been bitten several times by the much smaller back swimmers, which are only about a half inch long or so. And I do not want to ever get bitten by one of these giant water bugs. Uh, a friend of mine here in North Carolina was once teasing one that he'd found around uh, on the pavement under some lights. And he was poking it with his finger. And a uh, water bug at one time lunged when he was poking at the wrong moment and got him on the finger. and he remembers this uh, decades later as being one of the most painful experiences he ever had. Like an assassin bug, it injects a digestive enzyme, or like the predatory stink bugs that uh, Dave talked about, ingests a digestive enzyme that kills the prey and begins to digest it from the inside out. This was a very interesting sample that uh, came in last week. It's a scale insect on oak leaf hydrangea. 
And it's interesting for two reasons. Uh, number one, we hardly ever see insect problems of any significance or even at all on hydrangeas of any kind. They seem to be unusually insect free in my experience. And also, we seldom see such distinctive discoloration caused by the scale insect on uh, foliage of plants. Uh, there are a number of, um, say, high species and cultivars of hydrangeas uh, that are grown in North Carolina. A few are the most common ones. But I have never seen this kind of injury on any hydrangea before. And uh, oddly enough, we also had another oak leaf hydrangea come in last week uh, within a few days of this one that had been heavily damaged by Japanese beetles feeding on the new foliage. So for some reason, oak leaves have been taking a, a hit this, uh, this summer. A few of the leaves were even turning red like this. And each one of these spots represents a scale insect. The scale will be on one side of the leaf, but the discolorated, discolorated spot will be showing on the opposite side of the leaf from where the scale is. We sometimes see discoloration like this caused by the San Jose scale when it's feeding on the fruit and on the foliage of apple. But as far as I recall, with other armored scales, we don't see this kind of damage. Now, this is a species in the genus Abgrelaspis. It just came in last Friday, and I haven't got it uh, identified yet. It's probably either the Howard scale, Abgrelaspis howardi, or the Townsend scale, Abgrelaspis Townsendi. About three years ago, uh, John Vining sent in a rhododendron from Polk County that had Townsend scale on it with very similar discoloration like this. And uh, it was very unusual to see that. Whether this is because some of these Abgrelaspis scales have especially uh, toxic saliva that they secrete, or if oak leaf hydrangea is especially allergic, I can use that word, with plants uh, to the scales, I don't know. But in any case, it makes for a, a colorful sample. Uh, now, this is a close-up of the upper side of the leaf. And in this case, the scales on the upper side were entirely the male scales. Now, there were no females that I found on the upper side of the leaf. So these are the individual shells uh, or tests, the covers of the male scale insects. And this kind of uh, segregation at uh, different parts of the host plant is fairly common among some of the armored scales. For example, the uh, white peach scale is a very common armored scale. You get the males and the females on different parts of the plant. And same with the euonymus scale also. Usually when this happens, the males are going to be out in the foliage, and the females are going to be on the stems or on the petioles of the leaves. But uh, there can be other distributions that are different as well. A close-up of the underside of the leaf. The young scales settled underneath these trichomes, these woolly hairs that cover the underside of the leaf when they first hatched out. And the scales sort of grew under the hairs. So they're actually camouflaged in part by the hairs. Uh, the male scales, which look like tiny parasitoid wasps, were actually hatching out when this sample arrived. And they were cruising around looking for the females. Uh, females were mostly on this plant were either on the petioles of the leaves or if they're on the underside of the leaves, they're usually next to the, the midrib or the larger veins, whereas the males tend to be scattered everywhere else. Now, this is a, one of the scale species that can have multiple generations in a year, probably one in the far north, uh, two or three in, in the south. These are the first generation to mature from adults that overwintered. They will be laying eggs uh, starting the end of this month or in July. Those will hatch out, uh, mature by the end of summer. And I'm not sure if they will overwinter at the end of that second generation as adults or whether they will go ahead and try to produce a third generation. All right, now this is a really neat phenomenon uh, that we hear about every year. This is a mass of dark-winged fungus gnat larvae. And in this case, it is a species called Brunisia piscia. It is our largest species of dark-winged fungus gnats. And for some reason, uh, you may get hundreds or even thousands of these larvae coming together in a mass and then migrating across the surface of the ground. People usually see them when they're crossing sidewalks or driveways. Uh, sometimes they'll see them crawling through their lawn. And uh, they're usually going to be more active early in the morning before the sun gets up, or maybe on a cloudy, overcast day, you'll see them moving around. Um, 
Some people encounter these uh, in situations on a daily basis when the larvae are in season, so to speak. Others see them only sporadically. Uh, they are not going to be causing damage to the lawns. They seem to be more abundant or in lawns that have got a heavy thatch layer. Uh, so they're probably feeding on the underneath the decaying thatch material on that or on the fungi that are associated with the thatch. But in any case, they are not a risk to the, to the lawn itself. And say, why and, and how these larvae come together? Because the larvae in these masses are clearly more than just one brood. It's not just the, the larvae that hatch from one clutch. There are way too many of them. So they have to be multiple families or, uh, of, or broods of larvae that come together like this. But how they come together and how they decide where they're going and then, then how they eventually disperse again, all this is kind of a mystery. It's very difficult to study these things because they're so unpredictable when they're going to happen. Now, presumably, traveling in a group like this uh, reduces the risk of desiccation or reduces predator risk. But in this image, you can clearly see there's a, a much larger maggot of some kind traveling uh, with these dark-winged fungus gnat larvae. And, uh, these larvae themselves are a quarter to a third of an inch long. So this uh, larger maggot here, it's probably uh, one of the blowfly. There are several families of blowflies, and some of them include predatory and uh, parasit parasitoid fly larvae. Whether it is traveling with them and feeding on them as it goes, or it's simply traveling with them because it's a safe way to move, uh, I don't know. I would love to encounter one of these masses someday and, and see what's going on. Other people have reported seeing what appear to be beetles or ants uh, harassing these. And you know, I hear about you know, these kind of uh, observations. I think of a, of a pack of wolves following a huge herd of caribou somewhere in the Arctic tundra and harassing them and trying to pick off a straggler for a meal or something like that. Uh, actually, on a day like today, being on the Arctic tundra it kind of sounds like fun. It'd be a little bit cooler than what we're experiencing around here. But uh, in any case, uh, I've never uh, encountered one of these larval masses myself. I would love to someday. Now, the adult of this particular species, I say this is the largest uh, species of dark winged fungus gnat we have here in North Carolina. Uh, this is an adult female. She's black all over except for her abdomen, which is orange. The male would be similar in appearance, a little bit smaller in size, but he would be uniformly black, no orange to the abdomen. I have seen the uh, adults in my yard, although I haven't seen one of these larval masses. The adults are often seen resting in shady sites, uh, shady side of tree trunk, um, say a step well down to a basement door, to a shady foundation of the house, and they'll be flying around. But uh, the adults probably don't feed at all, or if they feed on anything, just on some sort of plant liquid. Uh, this was an image that was sent in, and uh, this is a species of long-legged fly. They're the Dalicopodidae condylostylus species. This is another group, a rather large group of flies, uh, most of them rather small, a quarter inch long or less. And uh, many of them have this green or gold metallic coloration. Not all of them are, color, are metallic colored like that. And some of them have uh, clouded or pictured wings, as this one does. Most of them have clear wings. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, adults of these uh, long-legged flies are predators. They probably feed on aphids, uh, midges. Some species are known to feed on mosquitoes. So they're beneficial if you see them in the garden. The larvae of these flies also are predators. Some of them are known to live in the galleries of bark beetles, uh, where they pursue their prey or are found under loose bark on dead trees. Uh, they're pretty little things, but if you see them in your garden, just leave them be because they are, they are beneficial. Now, this was an image sent in with the long-legged fly. And this is the elderberry borer. It's a, long, a species of longhorn beetle, Desmoceris palliatus. And reaching up to a, about an inch long, this is uh, one of the most distinctive distinctively marked insects here in the eastern United States. There is nothing else that looks like this. An inch long, this deep blue-black color with, with a bright gold base to the uh, wing covers. Uh, stunning insect. And it is not a pest unless you're trying to grow elderberry. It is host-specific to elderberry. 
They lay their eggs at the base of the shrubs or the trees. The larvae bore in the root system, and the adults can be found running around on the blossoms of the uh, American elderberry, Sambucus canadensis. There are additional species of cultivated elderberries from Europe, and I don't know if uh, any of them are attacked by this beetle. This uh, specimen was, this image was sent to us from Watauga County, uh, where along with the long-legged fly, they were found on vegetables in a garden. This is not a normal sort of situation, and I'm sure the beetle was not actually harming the vegetables. It probably just happened to land there. Another shot of the same beetle. Uh, as far as we know, this beetle is found only in our western counties, certainly in the mountains, possibly in the foothills of the mountains. The, uh, there is another species of native elderberry, Sambucus pubens, uh, which occurs only in our mountain counties, whereas the, uh, the other species, Sambucus canadensis, can be found throughout the entire state. I've looked in vain uh, here in the Raleigh area along the Greenway Trail and creeks when the elderberry is in blue. We've never seen this beetle on it and we don't have any specimens in the insect collection from the eastern part of the state, so presumably it's not here. Now, as a budding young entomologist growing up in New York State, uh, I'd always look forward to seeing these beetles each year when they'd be running around on the blossoms uh, of the plants growing along a small stream uh, near where I grew up. Okay, we do occasionally get scorpions sent into the clinic. Uh, there are not species of scorpions that are native to North Carolina. We do have one species which occurs in our southwestern most counties that occasionally turns up. But uh, we get to occasionally a third species. Uh, this is Centroides species, probably the Tatus. Uh, it was an image that was sent to us, and I wasn't able to get a really good look at it, so I'm kind of guessing on the species. They uh, get Transpo transported around by commerce and people moving. They hide in baggage and stuff and crates. Uh, there's no indication that any of these species have become established in North Carolina. None of the three species we've detected uh, have venom that is dangerous to humans. And in fact, most species of North American scorpions have venom which is not dangerous to people. The species uh, occurs naturally in several of the uh, states west of the Mississippi River and southern Great Plains. Very similar, closer related species, Centroides hensi. This species is native to Florida, southern Georgia, parts of the Gulf Coast. This one was actually sent in, so I was able to conclusively identify it. As you can see, it is quite similar to the other species, Centroides vitatus. Uh, adults are max out at about two inches long. The females are a little heavier body than the males. They live under loose bark in trash and rotten wood, feed on termites, small cockroaches, that sort of thing. Sometimes people keep scorpions as pests, uh, like they keep tarantulas, even centipedes and millipedes as pests. Um, a little creepy, perhaps, uh, but they can live for years, and if you're treated carefully, they're, they're just fine. This is this. Oops, I didn't mean to include this slide. This is just a view of an underside, underside shot of that centuries, hence I again. OK, uh, our largest species of wolf spider, another one of the big bugs, this is Hogna. It used to be the genus Lycosa, but Hogna carolinensis, the Carolina wolf spider. Uh, females may reach a body length up to about an inch and a half when with legs that can span three to four inches. Some of our smallest wolf spiders are only about a quarter inch long or less as adults. Most wolf spiders come in shades of brown and gray, usually well camouflaged when they're running around on the ground. Uh, some of the smaller species of wolf spiders are very common in lawns. That can seem to be more common there than anywhere else. And wolf spiders are terrestrial. They can be found in just about any sort of terrestrial and semi-aquatic habitat. And they are outdoor spiders. They do not live indoors. They do not set up shop indoors. And when they get inside, it's only by accident. And they are not going to stick around. This is a nice portrait of this wolf spider, and it shows a very distinctive eye arrangement of wolf spider. You've got four eyes in a row across the front, and then you have this second row is very strongly recurved like this. So actually, this is one row with the, the outer eyes set well back and the inner eyes set toward the front. Uh, this is different from other related families of spiders, which would have the second row of eyes essentially straight across the front, four eyes, not strongly recurved like this. Wolf spiders can spin silk just like all other spiders, but they don't spin webs to capture prey. Instead, they just run down their prey. Uh, they hunt visually. 
Some of them can dig their own burrows, and uh, as are most other spiders, they're very sensitive to vibrations, both vibrations coming through the ground and vibrations of air currents. None of our native wolf spiders have venom that's known to be dangerous to people, but certainly a bite from one of these things would be fairly painful. You could treat it like you would treat the sting from a bee or a wasp. This uh, critter came into uh, lights at my place last week. It's one of our largest longhorn beetles. It's sometimes called the brown prionis orthosoma brunium. It's closely related to species like the broadneck root borer and the tilehorn prionis, which are in the genus prionis and which sometimes cause damage. This one is not a threat to uh, living plants at all. It gets to about two inches long. It occurs in, uh, say, southern Canada through most of the eastern U.S., except maybe not in the deep south and they are attracted to lights at this time of year. They uh, say lay their eggs in dead wood, and they have been reported from a wide range of species of trees, both various kinds of broadleaf hardwood trees as well as conifers. They uh, may sometimes do structural damage, or uh, cause damage to structural wood if that wood is not treated, if it's damp, if it's in contact with the ground. The larvae you reached about two and a half three inches long and look like typical other longhorn beetle larvae and uh, may take two or even three years to complete the development. And uh, although, as you noticed, uh, this, this fellow has rather large uh, mandibles and he acted rather threatening, he really didn't try to bite even when I was restraining him like this. So they're not aggressive uh, and you can handle them pretty much with impunity. Okay, um, now last, uh, earlier this year we started getting images, uh, reports of Eliagnus down on the Outer Banks in the Currituck, Bear County areas that uh, Susan Ruiz Evans was sending into us. And they were seeing a lot of dieback. Some of the other images they sent were much more dramatic like this. An entire planting was virtually dead. So they started looking and they were finding this. Now, let's, uh, let's have a little quiz here and, and see if we can guess what this is. Uh, is this damage caused by the Eliagnus bark biter, by Boy Scouts practicing their wilt whittling, by beavers infesting the shrubbery, by miniature deer scraping the velvet off their antlers, or by European hornets chewing off the bark or paper mache to construct their nests? Okay, we're getting some guesses uh, all across the board. Click on and uh, click on that right there. The uh, blue and red bar. This is two, two to the right there. And that will show the distribution. All right, uh, and most people have correctly guessed this is being damage being caused by the European hornet. Uh, there is no such thing as an Eliacinus bark biter. Sorry, I just threw that one in for fun. The uh, European hornet, in addition to uh, our native species of hornets and yellow jackets and paper wasps, use wood pulp, either the chewed bark or frayed wood, to uh, chew up into a paper mache material. They mix it with their own saliva and they'll construct their nests out of this. Uh, it's difficult to see in this image, but in the intact specimen, we could actually see transverse scrapings in the in the uh, surface of the wood where they had chewed the bark off and um, kept and moving down. You see a little bit darker here. This is, this is where the the uh, mandible marks were in the wood. And nobody actually saw the hornets. Uh, Steve Dambert and I were, uh, kicked this around a bit, and we finally decided that it was probably European hornet. Uh, as opposed to a bald face hornet based on the width of the chew marks and also by the extent of the damage. Now they do have preferences for certain kinds of bark or certain kind of trees and shrubs when they're doing uh, this chewing and grabbing material for their nests. This uh, damage occurred sometime last year during the growing season and you can see the plant produced callus tissue here trying to recover from the injury and if the damage is not too severe the, uh, the branch may actually live for a while or even recover from the wound uh, if it's not grilled completely around. But in this case, they were obviously doing a great deal of damage and killing out the shrubs in large sections. I haven't seen this kind of damage here around Raleigh, and that means my time is up. 
So I managed to pull that uh, just in time. Uh, do we have any images images coming from the audience? Or if we have any questions, we'll try to answer them in the next minute or two here. I think we have a minute for a question. Dave, I was wondering, apparently you have been recorded as hanging out in a bunch of shady places recently. So I guess that was because you were looking for darkwing fungus knot snakes. Is that right? That could be. There are a lot of insects that hang out in shady places, and you go where the bugs are. Or at least I do. OK. All right, well, if, we, uh, if there are any additional questions, we can save them to the end. And now okay. it's Mike Munster's turn. Dave, let's take will... this one question since we were there. And that is, uh, how large does that wolf spider get? And what is the gold uh, color? That's be OK, uh, the, that species of wolf spider can reach a body length of about an inch and a half. Now, just as with fish and snakes, they always look a lot bigger when you first encounter them unexpectedly. Uh, with the leg spread, it can go to three and a half, uh, possibly even four inches. Typically, uh, female spiders are going to be larger than males of the same species. So uh, they say when you see one of those big, big ones, it may look like it's two inches long, the body two inches long, but really about an inch and a half is the maximum. Now, I'm not sure what gold-colored beetle would be feeding on the uh, hibiscus. There are some gold-colored tortoise beetles, which would be feeding on either morning glory or on sweet potato uh, or, or possibly certain other crops. Uh, hibiscus, the only thing that I've seen, there is a bug that feeds on the seed heads of rows of Sharon hibiscus. And there is a soft fly, the larvae feed on some of the foliage of some of the big tropical leaf, fly, uh, leaf tropical species. But I don't know about a gold uh, beetle on the foliage. I'd like to see an image or a specimen of that. It's not, whoever's seeing them can, can send it into it. All right. Well, thank you very much. We're 0 for 2 for Carolyn. But uh, let's have to move on here for just a second. And we are going to now have. Mike Munster, and I have but one word for Mike Munster, our next speaker, and that is UFTA. Um, I have no idea what that means, but I'm sure this is going to be UFTA. So, Mike, if you are ready to go, can you go ahead and start out? I can do that. Actually, um, I would like to st would have liked to start out with uh, a couple of questions for our master gardeners, but they didn't get included. Uh, let me just mention, though, that we have several outlets here at the clinic for disseminating plant disease and insect pests, insect and other arthropod pest information. And one of those is our PDIC blog, which uh, Emma Lookabaugh coordinates. And the recent topics in that include slime molds, which I'm going to talk about today, but also tomato spotted wilt virus on tomatoes, one on peach diseases that Dr. Dave Ritchie did, a brief one on wet wood and slime flux in trees, and one on powdery mildew. So I don't know how many of you folks are, were even aware of the blog or are keeping up with it, but this is another way that we are trying to get information out to you and to the general public. So. Please do check it out and pass the word. It can be accessed from our PDIC main page, which is typing now, which is that simple. All right. Let me start off with the pathogen section here, talking about this sample of winged elm that came from Durham County earlier this month. And we've had several samples come to the clinic this year with suspected Dutch elm disease, but this is the only one that was actually confirmed. And this was an excellent sample. It came in very fresh, and it had branches of the ideal diameter to check, which is about a half an inch. So a large branch like this that has uh, different sized twigs and, and small branches with a range of symptoms on them, and freshly cut is the ideal sample for us to be able to check for Dutch elm disease. It's interesting that one of the samples that was sent, was sent in for 
possible Dutch elm disease was Zelkova, which is in the elm family, the Elmaceae, but it turns out that Zelkova is not susceptible to Dutch elm disease, so rest easy on that one. Some of our native elms, of course, American winged elm, slippery elm, are very susceptible, and the Siberian Chinese elms are considered resistant, although there is variability within the Siberian elms. And many of us have memories, sad memories, of how this disease once devastated the, the urban landscapes in, in my case, in the Midwest, especially in my mother's hometown in South Dakota. But uh, it actually continues to occur, and so it's not letting us forget that it's out there. What, and this is my question for you, what would be the key symptom you would look for if you saw a tree that you thought had Dutch elm disease? And let's see if people would try to type in maybe using the text box here on the toolbar rather than the chat box and see if the answers will show up there on the white part of the board. Okay, yeah, the wooden shoes, that would give it away as being Dutch. Um, the wilt on the young twigs, it can, it can start out on individual branches, that's true. And that would be a, a fairly typical case. But what I was looking for as, there it is, someone from Wayne County typed it in. Apart from the flagging, these individual limbs that yellow and wilt, the dark streaking in the wood of the branches, or vascular streaking, because the vascular system of the plant, this island, is what's, uh, what's being affected and colonized and uh, blocked both by the fungus and by the reaction of the host tree trying to wall it off, but not fast enough. So if you see this vascular streaking, then that's a really good clue that you may have Dutch elm disease. You would want to send it in, though, for confirmation. The uh, verticillium wilt will produce vascular streaking as well. My impression, though, is that that is not a big problem in North Carolina outside of the mountains. So um, again, before anybody spends a great deal of money, which sometimes people think about in terms of trunk injections for or fungicide injections to try and save a specimen tree, do get a confirmation that you have Dutch elm disease. The, it's interesting, the story of the fungi that caused this um, originally, the, uh, the epidemic was caused by the fungus Ophiostoma ulmi. It was called Ceratocystis ulmi earlier. You may have heard that term. But then another species, Ophiostoma novo ulmi, came and displaced it as the, as the uh, Dutch elm disease pathogen in this country. Just a little reminder of the life cycle of this particular disease. It can be transmitted by root grass between adjacent trees, but mainly we think about the transmission by introduced species of elm bark beetles. Remember that these beetles will breed in logs under the bark, and they, at least the, um, the one of the species, causes this typical gallery here where the female tunneled along the wood and laid eggs, and the individual larvae then tunneled outward from that, making this ornate sort of gallery. This is where the beetles pick up the fungus if that log was infected. Where the actual business of inoculation occurs is when those emerging adults fly up to the small twigs of the elms and start feeding. And that's where the uh, tree gets inoculated, and then the fungus spreads in the vascular system from that point. So theoretically, if you caught it quick enough, you could actually prune that out. Oh, I, I would um, also mention back on this other one, the importance in terms of controlling Dutch elm disease to continue to be vigilant and break that life cycle of beetles. If you have a tree that has died of Dutch elm disease or suspected of it, don't just leave the wood stacked up as firewood, make sure and 
and debark it or another, uh, some other way destroy or bury it so that you are not providing a breeding ground for those beetles and uh, that's the best way to, to break that cycle. There are now a number of resistant American elm cultivars that have been released. released. Um, not all of these, though, are going to be tolerant of elm yellows. And I was checking and did not find any records that we have of elm yellows being confirmed in North Carolina. I can't guarantee that for a fact. But uh, so far, I have not been able to find any confirmation of that. This is actually a situation where, uh, that I talked about in 2009, the first year that we did the Illuminate version of plant pests and pathogens. But questions continue to come up, so I wanted to bring it up again for those who may be new master gardeners or unfamiliar with this particular situation. And the question that I have for you is, true or false? This stuff is dangerous. Let's see a green check for those who believe it is and a red X for those who think it is innocuous. All right. 22 out of 45 folks um, believe it's innocuous. Um, none believe it's dangerous. And 23 were unable to get to their mouse in time. I should have specifically mentioned that uh, I mean dangerous to, to people, plants, and animals. If you are a bacterium or a bit of organic detritus in the mulch or in the soil, then yes, this uh, could be a problem because it is the dog vomit slime mold, scientific name Fuligoseptica, which spends part of its life cycle as sort of a film of protoplasm called the plasmodium in the, uh, in the mulch, in the soil, on wood, and slowly creeps along engulfing bacteria and bits of organic matter as food source. And then something happens, the call of nature, some kind of trigger occurs, and the whole organism makes the irreversible switch to a spore-producing phase, which is when we start to notice it. It usually starts out as a kind of a yellow, frothy, mass, liquidy, but then it becomes very quickly a buff or pink color with an outer crust and then the dark spores that form inside. And in fact, it is not dangerous to plants. It can cover them uh, quite a bit and I suppose uh, block out light from photosynthesis, but it wouldn't be a real pest, nor is it toxic. There, uh, have been, it has been shown, though, that some people are allergic to the airborne spores of this. While we're talking about slime molds, I wanted to mention a few others. And this is a sample that came in from Onslow County to our turf pathologist back in May. And it turned out to be the uh, slime mold, and this is best I could identify it as Physarum cinerium. Now, just to go back to your Latin, remember cinerium, you sometimes see the cineria, means ash gray, and it's very well described as uh, it gives an ashy color to the material on which it's grown. These are the spore-bearing bodies, again, the sporangia. And a clue here that you're not dealing with any kind of a real disease is that the spores are being produced both on the grass as well as on the weed here, the Carolina geranium. This was a picture of probably another Fisarum on a cucumber leaf that was sent in by Ann Edwards from Carteret County in June of this year. And if we take a little bit closer look, you can see that the individual sporangia are visible with a white outer coating. They actually deposit lime in, uh, in their sporangia. And the interior is filled with the dark spores that will then blow away and start the life cycle over again. Now, it turns out that this is what I had suspected when I first saw the pictures that Charlotte Glenn forwarded. These are archived pictures from September of last year from New Hanover County in Wilmington. But she said she has uh, seen the same in uh, Pender County, I believe she said. But then on closer inspection, it doesn't seem that this is something on the surface. It's that the leaf is actually uh, drying up, bleaching out, 
and had the life sucked out of it. It doesn't look like a disease that I recognize, and I showed it to Dave, and he doesn't recognize it as any kind of insect or mite injury. So this one's going to have to remain a mystery unless somebody out there recognizes it. So sorry, Charlotte. If you do see it again, though, please just send it so that we can try and uh, get a look at it in the microscope. Third slime mold that you're most likely to see would be something in the genus Staminitis. These pictures I took out of the Shank Forest a few falls ago. And they're very picturesque. If you look at them up close, you'll see that they have a little dark stalk underneath each sporangium, which is the long spore-bearing part of it up here. And this will occasionally even show up in an indoor environment where it's uh, Found, uh, I have a picture, I don't know exactly where it came from, but on a hardwood floor where a clump of this was, was fruiting. It looks sort of hair-like as, uh, as you look at it with the naked eye. Now, changing gears just slightly here, this is a sample that came from a greenhouse in Mecklenburg County last month. It wasn't quite this covered in mold when it came in, but this is what happened after a few days in a humid chamber in incubation. And it turns out that this, you I'm sure you've seen, well, maybe not. Um, let's see, if you've seen this, give a green check, please. If not, uh, a red X. And if you left to go to the bathroom, then that's great. Does this, this occur sometimes in bags of potting soil? Because that's where I've seen something similar. Absolutely. What if that potting soil contained peat? Uh, it may occur in some other substrates too, but the um, one second here, move that out of the way. This is actually something that is known under the common name of the peat as a peat mold. Scientific name is Chromelosporium oliare. And this is not a slime mold. This is actually a true mold, a true fungus. And it's quite beautiful when viewed up close under the stereo microscope there, the way that it produces its spores on these little uh, clusters. Sort of reminds you of that staminitis in the previous picture. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do harm to the plants. In fact, the only plant that's ever been shown to be susceptible to it uh, under inoculation was a plant called Cranby. Grand the Abyssinica. It possibly could, if it were really abundant on the um, on the surface of the media, it could possibly make it a little bit hydrophobic. We heard about a little bit of hydrophobic soils earlier, and um, and I wanted to add to that too that sometimes these artificial organic-based potting mixes, if they're allowed to dry out, will become hydrophobic, not necessarily from this particular organism. But this is something that you may see or people may bring in as uh, occurring on potting soil in pots on, uh, well, this is in peat cubes in this case, but it is a mold that is not going to harm the plant. I really don't know uh, the potential as an allergen or, or anything like that. I don't know of any human problems associated with it, but I, I couldn't rule those out completely. But I, I've never seen information about that. This uh, particular sample was extra interesting because it had what I took to be or take to be the sexual stage, the other stage of the fungus, also fruiting on the samples that came in on the surface of the peat. And that's the little cup-shaped apothecium here. There's a less mature one here. Which this is the only time that I've ever seen that, I believe. I wanted to share this interesting situation from Anson County that uh, Amy Rankin sent in. It was a pear, and uh, the complaint of the owner is from a backyard orchard of a couple of trees. The complaint from the owner was that this tree had previously produced normal-sized edible pears and for the last couple of years was producing these little pears. And what was happening? There was also some 
shriveling uh, occurring on the uh, some of these fruits, which we don't know what it was. But uh, anybody want to take a guess as what was going on here? Well, I wouldn't have figured it out either. It was Turner Sutton who suggested that it may be root suckers, that the rootstock of the plant had sent up some shoots that then flowered and produced these small fruits different from the scion cultivar that was the edible type. And Amy had gotten in touch or heard from the grower who confirmed that they were in fact root suckers that were coming up. So kind of a mystery solved there and, uh, and detected work by Dr. Turner Sutton. I've got a question here. What would be causing red discoloring of leaves of blueberry plants? Um, that, I'm not sure about. Is it general red all over, a general turning of the leaves, or are they red spots? Okay, well, uh, just typing in there. Let's uh, go back to the picture here because we are short on time. We've been seeing a lot of tomato samples this year. That is not unusual here in the clinic. It's uh, one of our most popular clients, our most popular patients. And one of the things that Emma has reported seeing a lot of is this particular disease, which turns out was septoria leaf spot in this case and in many others. Now, if you look very, very, very closely, you might be able to make out some of the little dark specks that are the fruiting body of the fungus. But if not, you could confuse this for some other diseases. In fact, even to be a wilt could look like this. So unless you've been uh, trained and have experience to be able to confirm this under the microscope, it would be good to have confirmation of this because in this case, the control or management strategies are going to be very different from what they would be for tomato spotted wilt. In this case, you can remove those leaves. You want to make sure they don't go into the compost pile. I read that you can remove up to a third of the foliage of the plant. You want to avoid leaf wetness. Try and keep the leaves as dry as possible by watering at times of the day that will encourage drying. There are a couple of fungicides that you can use. You can use nicoseb or chlorothalonil or for organic folks, you can use copper. They are only protected fungicides, though. They will protect healthy leaves from becoming infected. They will not cure or eradicate the fungus from diseased leaves. Another good thing to practice here would be rotation, moving your tomato production area to a different spot for the following year. Turns out that the same person who brought in that sample with the septoria leaf spot had this particular problem on a few of the fruit. And the question that uh, I have at the bottom here, true or false, the fungus that causes this symptom can also cause decay in the lower stem of the tomato. So green check for true, red X for false. So somebody changed their answer. They changed it the right way. All right, of the 10, one third of the folks who voted, the nine who said yes were correct. This is actually a disease. It's called buckeye rot, and it's caused, um, usually we say, by Nicotiani, the species Phytophthora uh, Nicotiani, which is well known for causing root rots and stem rots on a variety of plants, and this can, in fact, cause a root rot moving up into the lower stem of tomato. This is one that you could probably diagnose yourself. The kind of olive, greenish brown spot, large, a little bit concentric in the margins. It's smooth. You see it's not particularly sunken. Um, there's really 
nothing else that looks quite like this, with the exception of late blight when it infects fruit. And um, the, the case, in this particular case, we didn't suspect late blight because, well, it was been too hot and dry for one thing, but there were no late blight symptoms on the leaves. I see Emma has uh, chimed in there also. This is a this is a firm rot. This is not a, a watery rot of the fruit. What to do in this particular case? Well, this if it's your only problem, um, remove the fruits obviously that are affected. But the key here is to avoid contact of the fruit with the soil or splashing of the soil onto the fruit. It does not need wounds to infect, but it does inhabit the soil primarily. So mulching would be the main tactic that you would want to employ as well as a, uh, a three-year rotation, at least out of silanaceous crops in that particular area. Now those, uh, those same fungicides, as I mentioned, for septoria may, may also be helpful. But personally, I wouldn't use fungicides if this were my only problem. All right, going back to Barbara's question here, what would be the uh, spots and edges? I'm not sure, Barbara, if you could send us a, uh, a picture. Mike, I just That's posted that off of your one of the pages, not your page. I don't know if that, those are the spots that she might be talking about, if they look like that. All right, well, we'll let her reply to that. And let me just very quickly mention uh, uh, association. Um, of course, it's uh, something with a little genetic predisposition, but we don't really know what causes the trigger. If you do see it, enjoy it, but it's not really contagious and uh, not a problem to worry about. Uh, this is a sort of a, um, one that my heart sank when I saw it, but it turned out that I was wrong. This particular greenhouse cucumber had trips injury, but it made it look like it had this, which we have now got confirmed in North Carolina for this year, cucurbit downy mildew. And I have talked about this in the past. Typically, the angular lesions start out yellow, turn a kind of a tan brown color. And you may, in humid weather, see the sort of grayish, purplish fuzz of the sporulation on the underside of the leaf, unlike the powdery mildew, which is going to cause the white patches here on both sides of the leaf, whereas the downy mildew will have the yellow that then turns into, into a spot. And this is uh, a very serious problem. Uh, tends to be worse on cucumber and cantaloupe, but can, of course, get on uh, squash and pumpkin, whereas the squash and pumpkin would tend to get more of the, the powdery mildew as a problem, although both are air dispersed. If we are out of time, I'll just refer folks to the latest issue of Pest News and to the website that was the website for the Cucurba Downy Mildew Forecasting Center. For homeowners, just keep your leaf wetness to a minimum and harvest fruit early if you're getting sunburned because you're losing leaves. Some preventive applications of forest down or copper may help, but it's really uh, a losing battle if the weather is in favor of disease. Maybe plant earlier next year or consider moving out to the Great Plains of the States or the Pacific Northwest where the disease does not reach. Even um, Minnesota would be a good choice. It did reach it last year, but uh, generally doesn't get that far. So uh, I guess we are probably out of time. Well, I think we'll take questions if here. If you have any more speculation on that, uh, if we can follow up on that blueberry, uh, more generalized spots, she says. Any? Like, John, no, I really. Okay. Off the top of my head, I don't. I would definitely look at the roots and uh, and see how they look. Make sure that uh, you have your soil checked. Okay. If those don't pan up, then send us a sample, yeah, pictures, or, or a physical sample. And please, please, just uh, emphasize this important thing of always check your roots. Uh, there's root rot out there. There's root not nematode out there, and if you're not looking at those, then you're not going to Okay, well, while we're waiting, if there is a question, um, let's see. We have some upcoming schedule here. Uh, hopefully, Lucy, Lucy will be back. Poor thing is on her way to China right now. It's a tough thing she's doing, but um, 
Hopefully she's enjoying that trip to China. She'll be back and maybe share some of her things with us. Our next uh, program is going to be August 23rd. And along with our usual outstanding agents, uh, Frank Rose will be talking about organic disease management for garden vegetables. So we, Frank hasn't been on for a while, but he is great and he's entertaining. We always love to have him. So that'll be great. Uh, let's see. These are Lucy has plugged these in here. Are the usual things. First, we're going to see Mike on Almanac Gardener and in the garden with Bryce. Um, oh, okay. Mike, what is this? Did you want to make a comment on it? Um. <laughs> after after we All right, close up the recording, we'll be looking forward to it. Uh oh, we're not doing that one. Uh oh, we're not doing that one. Okay. Well, what do you know? All right.